19 days since Nigeria had its seventh consecutive presidential elections under democratic rule. The results collated by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, saw President-elect Bola Metinubo of the APC announced as winner. Despite the conclusion of what was deemed to be an electioneering process completely driven by technology, a cross-section of Nigerians, the international community and observers believe the election was marred by violence, disenfranchisement, voter suppression, failure for INEC to play to the electoral laws governing the uploading of results immediately from each polling unit amidst other insinuations of rigging. In two days from now, the gubernatorial elections will take place and the questions that come to mind are Have Nigerians lost confidence in the electoral process? How exactly can INEC redeem its image? And what have political parties decided to do in line with the lessons learned from the presidential elections? Joining us live from London, England, the spokesperson of the Atiku Okowa campaign, Daniel Boala. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right, now let's talk about the presidential elections that held on the 25th of February. What we did see was that uh, people, members of your political party as well as the Labour Party um, argued about the outcome of the elections. Um, is that a position that your party is still holding and um, what, are, what are your thoughts on INEC as we, as we count down to the gubernatorial elections? Well, uh, thank you for having me. I, I think that it is Nigerians that have actually protested against the outcome because uh, regardless of the political party affiliations, you would have noticed that for the past one or two weeks, there have been uh, complaints from various quarters. In fact, even amongst the APCs, there are some of them who have also complained that there were irregularities in the election, but their defense was that, or is that, uh, it is not mandatory for INEC to have uploaded or to upload the results in the, in the IA viewing portal. But let me... I uh, start by saying that uh, as a People's Democratic Party, we strongly object to the outcome and the process that led to the outcome because of the following reasons. One, I think as an unbiased umpire or supposed unbiased um umpire by the regulator for the election set the rules of engagement to all political parties. Unfortunately, I think did not abide by the rules they set both for themselves and for the political party. So, it raises the question of credibility, transparency, and character. Secondly, uh, the process that led up to the announcement of the election result were also not consistent with the provisions of the Electoral Act, particularly Section 65, where it states that in the course of coalition, if there are issues, uh, you know, that uh, there have arisen as a result of the elections at the polling unit that the commission shall have within seven days to rectify the issue before the final announcement. The INEC chairman was asked the question in the course of coalition. Unfortunately, he misinterpreted that part of the law and even promised that after announcement, he was going to look into it in seven days, which he never did anyway. And then the third one is that uh, INEC is well aware, and in fact, he was even asked uh, prior to the election, what if in this election there is no clear winner? Are you prepared for a rerun? He said yes. And he cited example. Now, the provision of Section 134 uh, of the Constitution is also clear that where any of the candidates scores the majority, but he does not fulfill the mandatory requirement of securing 25% in the FCT, that person cannot be declared as the winner of that election. So uh, you notice that on that day, it, even in the alleged false report or result that was announced by INEC, uh, you would see that INEC also recognized the fact that Tinibu did not get or secure the 25% of the uh, votes in the FCT. But the INEC chairman uh, went ahead and did that. Now, after all this, and then political parties started raising objection, you would have thought that the INEC chairman would give himself the opportunity to explore the provisos to Section 65 to say, okay, since I've done what I have done, and I've said that I was going to look into it, we have seven days, I'm going to look into the results and the complaint, and then we, I will reverse myself, because that's what uh, the import of Section 65 that was introduced in the new amendment, uh, that's the import, that INEP will provide a service that looks like a quasi-court to correct preliminary issues before then uh, whatever decision they make can be subjected to court. So on the evidence of that, 
not just the international community and we PDP, but I think Nigeria and the entire world are not uh, comfortable with that. So I yep. played the role of a participant criminal. They played that role. It's not an ignorant role. It is a conscious, deliberate, and decisive decision that I need to, to confer advantage to all progressive Congress and deliver to the as a winner. Yeah, you also seem very confident. I, I read through your tweet. You seem very confident that the um, result will be overturned by the court. You know, can you share with us, you know, why you feel so? Right. So uh, my confidence, ordinarily, uh, there is this traditional or default belief in Nigeria that the Supreme Court is a final court and that the decision of the Supreme Court is final not because they are infallible, but they are infallible because it is final. So in other words, even if they wrong, even if they go wrong, everybody will have to accept. So that has been the tradition, and people tend to believe that uh, even when finally it gets to the Supreme Court, you won't expect that the court will overturn that decision because traditionally they've never done that. And so you would have noticed that even in your engagement with the Nigerian people, you see that nobody has confidence that the outcome of the election will result in invalidation, even in the event that you produce overwhelming evidence. But here is my confidence. There is a growing concern around the world that democracy is being threatened. If you have noticed the West African sub-region, in the last one year or two years, we have seen some military takeovers. And this is because there is a discontentment uh, you know, among the civil populace that this democracy is not delivering. So that has provided opportunity for the military to do that. And that is an apparent something that we is in our past. We would never like it. Then outside of the sphere of Africa, in the rest of the world, you see how democracy is being challenged to see the strength of it. In America, in January 6, they challenged the very foundation of the democracy. So America and the rest of the world realized that, look, we have to deepen this democracy and strengthen it. And democracy is strengthened by the rule of law. So you see in Africa, for the first time, Kenya Supreme Court delivered a verdict against an incumbent president and ordered for a fresh election, even though at the time the complaint was that there was no enough money and it will cause crisis. All of the excuses that people are giving in Nigeria were given in Kenya. And the, the president was allegedly, allegedly considered as brutal because I read the report of how in the build-up to that, 1,600 people were killed by the law enforcement, all in a bit to suppress human rights. Yet the people proceeded and delivered the judgment against the incumbent and ordered a fresh election. Then the, the candidate who was excited with that now said, this is a watershed in Africa. That was repeated in Malawi. It, it has similar fact, similar pattern. And, and, and if you look at Nigeria, in comparison with these two countries where the elections were invalidated, we have now a more compelling case in Nigeria than in Kenya and Malawi. And because... Uh, the, the, the rest of the world are concerned about strengthening democracy. I believe that all eyes are on Nigeria, and, in, as, and at this time, all eyes are on our judicial system. Because the judicial system now, in my view, as some people will argue otherwise, at once or trial, we are testing our law and we are testing our democracy. We are going to see yeah. how strong the democracy is Mr. Mr. Bala, by the judicial system. Mr. Bala, we're working very hard on time. So please, in 30 seconds, can you give us like two specific um, instances that will be presented in court um, that will, of course, um, you know, that you're confident will the, the Supreme Court will rule in your favor? So Section 134 provides for three. The one is on qualification, that the person who was declared winner at the time of election was not qualified. We will present a case to the court to establish that part of the ground for qualification is your certificate. As well, as Wajibola well, Tinibu uh, tendered his certificate of his Chicago University, he did not tender any of his pre-university certificate. The Supreme Court in Buhari's case said, you need to just show that you have attended a level to the extent of secondary. Since he didn't do that, he will be judged based on Chicago. And you know, that certificate is controversial too. The election was marred with irregularity. There was overvoting, voter suppression, and rigging, and all of that. We will proceed to establish that when we do that, we will have it reversed. And the third and last one is that the Section 134 sub 2 says uh, that somebody has to get the majority of the lawful vote and has 25 in the FCT. In this case, Asuaju was declared winner without the 25. So these three, among many others, are the compelling reason that this 
uh, election is going to be invalidated. Um, Mr. Bola, stating what your compelling reasons are, and you're talking about a reversal, do you foresee that we are going to probably have fresh elections done here in Nigeria? Is that, is that what, what you're, you're going to be praying the court? Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. And INEC chairman does not have any basis to give an excuse because he was asking one of the stakeholder engagement before the elections that since the bookmarkers, the uh, pollsters, projections are given that because it's a three-way traffic, that there's likely going to be a rerun. How are you going to deal with that? He said, we, per we perceived that that possibility and prepared and budgeted for that. So if a rerun is ordered, INEC will, does not have any excuse. Of course, we have law enforcement, we have the ballot paper and everything. So if an order for a rerun is given, we are perfectly in order as a country to go and then test the popularity of the candidates. All right, we'd also like you to uh, shed some light as to some of the conversations we're hearing about some form of alliance being formed between the People's Democratic Party and the Labour Party. Uh, we've seen that uh, the news does report that the Labour Party has endorsed the PDP candidate in Ogun State. We were also seeing in the news that of Nasara. I would like you to maybe clarify that uh, for us. Actually, I do not have uh, enough facts about alliances at the state level. You know, because I speak as spokesman to the presidential campaign, I focus more on my lay, you know, you know, my lay, you know. But we have spokespersons in the various states who are speaking on behalf of the party at that level. And I'm aware I'm also reading that uh, in various places there are these alliances. So I won't be surprised if there is any alliance going on. But uh, I must confess that I do not have all of that facts because they don't fall within my lane. Well, you know, that might also include the Lagos state example because, you know, there's instances or in, in, insinuations that the PDP has lost steam in Lagos State and uh, might be you know, advisable at this point, you know, to merge with the Labour Party if they're going to, you know, wrestle power from the APC in Lagos State. Uh, if you can uh, throw your thoughts in on that one. And then also, I want you to speak on, yes, on Wiki. Um, many have said that his, you know, fallout with your party and with the can your, your presidential candidate led to the PDP's, you know, losing the elections or not doing so well in the elections. Um, quickly share quite, frankly, quite frankly, that notion is false and has been proven by the elections. First of all, we even lost out uh, in the real results to uh, Labour. But in the, in the, he forged and forged all kinds of things were done. But even then, even, even if we take him on that, how many votes was he able to give to Tinubu? But that is yeah. So, so you're saying are you saying that the the River State elections and results were rigged or were not? Yes, yes, they were rigged. But what I'm saying is, even if I take it on what has been reported, the results, the vote numbers that he gave to APC is insignificant. Then you just suppose that with other members of the G5 that have all lost their elections in the National Assembly. So if they are relevant as, as they are being projected in the media. They will not only have damaged our chances, but they would have been able to win their elections. So the, it is inconsequential. It's just that he had the money to, you know, pay media and they made all the noise in the world. But that's even the reason why they didn't give him what he bargained for with APC in the deal. And right now, he's going to be tested again at the state level, whether or not he has that capacity. So what actually uh, uh, affected our vote to an extent is the Peter will be and the Labour Party because the church, you know, supported him. But even then, nothing has actually changed. We still won the election, but it was rigged. So it is inconsequential whether... Your allegations of rigging, who are, who are these allegations towards? You know, if you say that the PDP won the election, but it was rigged, who are these allegations yeah, so of rigging pointed towards? The, uh, the allegation, it is, it is not an allegation, it is, it's a contestation. That's why we're in court. The process is, when you feel you are rigged, you first open your mouth and express it, then you go to court and prove it. Not that you close your mind and go to court. So what I'm telling you is what we are set out to prove in court. You know, because take for example, my brother, look at the IRA. After they did the announcement, they now uploaded the result in the IRA. Just send any of your investigative journalists to do checks. You see that the result that was announced and returned are quite different from the ones uploaded in the IREC IRA itself. All right. Seeing as we're still talking about uh, very quickly, let's talk about uh, the G5 and the integrity group. Um, the news also is reported that uh, your presidential candidate had said that he, uh, near some weekend, that is, led his colleagues into political suicide. What are the projections for, you know, their careers, the, all the members of the G5, uh, in the integrity group, going forward? What is the projection for what might become of their political stance? 
what, what, what happens generally in life is that there is this thing called seed time and harvest will never cease. Anything else can change. So the law of life is that whatever you sow, you reap. Politically, as a party, the party has not sat down to take a decision on the various anti-party activities they have conducted or they have done. Like, for example, you know, we did, very strangely, he went to court and got an order stopping the party from stopping him from doing anti-party. And, and with time, there will be a conversation around whether the courts are being controlled by certain individuals. Because sometimes people go to court, the kind of order they get, there is no support in any law that we have in Nigeria. But politically, I think that Wiki haven't lost out in terms of relevance. APC may not give him the credence. And if he loses his candidate, this governorship again, that is the end for him politically. Then you look at uh, Ugo a very responsible man, but look at the backlash. He lost the National Assembly. He lost the National Assembly. Otonku took religious politics and ethnic politics to the new level. He too lost with all the entrieties. So this, this is what you see generally in life. They came to do evil, and then the evil fell back on them. But our we don't wish people bad. We wish people the best. It's God that judges. But sit time and have is definitely never goes away. Then, Ebola, I want to take you back to the IREV uh, um, conversation that you mentioned now. Uh, is there any you know places that you saw in the conduct of the elections that the results that were shown or that were uh, um, gotten at the polling unit were different? Um, from what was presented to INEC for the PDP. Yeah. You know, yes, PDP. for example, Rivers is one, Lagos is two. There are quite a number of uh, uh, states. And you know, because if you go to the IREV, you see it by state, by local government, by ward, by poly unit, and then, you know, yeah, poly unit, there are quite many. But the preliminary expo expose that so far that has been made available to the media suggested a fundamental flaw with INEC result as uploaded eventually with the result that was announced. But we all know, because the thing is, uh, as a political party, if a political party was uh, spread, you would have had all of your agents in the 170,000 poly unit. So you already have a duplicate copy of the copies of the result sheet. So if you do the tabulation, you know where you stand. And so whatever you see that is uploaded, that is being used, you know the way there is a differential. But what we are now talking is not even my word against your word. They finally uploaded to a certain degree in the island, but they have announced. So look at the ones that have announced. Identify a state or a local government or a ward or a polling unit and check. There are some, many of them that have corresponded. But in key areas where APC didn't have power and they manipulated, the evidence is there. That's right. what we are going to prove. Let me tell you what APC has given as an excuse. They are tacitly admitting rigging, but they are trying to say that the law does not mandate INEC. To work with electronically uploaded results so that they believe if they can show that the law does not mandate INEC, INEC then anything else INEC has uploaded now cannot be believed. It is that one that they announced that should be believed. So we'll test the law. All right. Um, as we count down the days to the gubernatorial elections, uh, there have been a number of people who have expressed concern as to INEC's preparedness for the elections. I'd like to find out your thoughts on that as well. Yes, I doubt if INEC is uh, prepared at all because uh, INEC compromises itself. But uh, INEC may make the effort to prove people that day. You know, because the presidential was actually their focus. If you recall that day, the results that were being uploaded, the one for National Assembly was uploaded seamlessly. It is presidential that they claim it was slow. So there was a target. But in terms of the governorship, I know that they will try to right some wrong to give the impression that they were able to work on those things that they call error. But I can tell you, and I'm predicting it to you, by Saturday, the election, by Monday, Tuesday, we'll still be back talking about inefficiency, incompetence, and yet over 300 and something billion was spent. It's about time EFCC started investigating. I read somewhere that 120 something billion was earmarked for ICT protection. 100 and something billion. Nigeria is a banana country, please. All right, uh, Dana Bala, quickly also share your thoughts on um, those who, uh, the insinuations that the PDP has withdrawn its court case against INEC or, and uh, to inspect uh, the election materials that were used. Can you share, quickly share your thoughts on that? Um, or, of course, yeah. you know, see if that is uh, false or, or, or true. And then also, there's also statements that I've seen critical of your uh, principal, uh, Atiku Abubakar, and his seeming, you know, not very, he's not very, very, 
eager to campaign for the state governorship candidates. Um, we've not seen him on the, you know, on the campaign trail with these candidates or, or anything like that. So can you quickly speak on those two things? Okay, so let me start with the last one. I think it's a false premise. Which of the other candidates that has gone around campaigning for any? Peter Obi walked through uh, Edo, and then he went to one other state again. In his official Twitter, he said he was passing through. He didn't say he went to campaign. I'm sure you know that Suaju has not been seen for the past five, six days. So, but Atiku issued a video which was televised yesterday, and he called on Nigerians to renew their hope in Nigeria's democracy and go out and vote. And his points are clear. Go, and go out and vote your conscience. But whatever it is, exercise your right. Then secondly, with respect to that tribunal matter, I think yesterday, APC people tried to spin it. We applied, you know, I, there was an order for INEC to allow us to inspect. So INEC continued to refuse it for more than one week. And their claim was that they are reconfiguring. So when they saw that time was running out, we now filed an application in court to mandate them again. And by this time, they've already started complying. So the lawyer for INEC now communicated to our team and our team leader and said, why don't you just withdraw the application when we come to court tomorrow since we have started complying with it already. So on the D-Day, when the matter came up, we now withdrew the application because compliance has commenced already. But you could see that APC spin it as though, uh, in fact, I saw somewhere they say Atiku has even withdrawn from the possibility of going to court. They are suffering from what we call astrophobia. Astrophobia is a fear of thunder and lightning because they stole the election. So anything else will make them cringe and react in a certain way. Antonio Boala, interested in speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, we look forward to, you know, getting you in again after the government Thank elections. You, um, or, you know, Thank you very much. Today. Thanks for your time. Right. Yeah. Well, right. Still <laughs> talking about our next approach to the presidential election and expectations ahead of Saturday's governorship election. We have joining us now political activist and spokesperson for the Obidati Campaign Council, Dele Farutimi, I beg your pardon. Uh, he'll be joining us this morning to expand this conversation even further. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, we're, we're having a conversation about the election so far, and I think I'll start off with the last question that I asked our last guest. As to your thoughts on INEX preparedness for the gubernatorial elections holding in the next few days. <laughs> The question is, what is INEC prepared to do? Um, they assured us on the 25th, they were prepared. We were going to have this seamless election that would rival anything that has been done anywhere in the world for fairness and transparency. And these guidelines were issued and the brilliant professor of INEC was busy reassuring the world how free and fair our elections will be. So we were prepared as Nigerians. We trooped out in our numbers. And I never proved itself to be completely useless, if the truth be told. So now, the same body, headed by the same rotting heads, are busy assuring us that we would have seamless, free and fair elections on Saturday. So when you ask about the readiness of INEC, I'm sorry to say, painful as it is, INEC is not ready. Readiness in the terms of, are you ready to provide free and fair elections? Are you ready to allow Nigerians to vote their consciences? Or would we be witnessing the same monkeying around that we saw on the 25th? I don't believe INEC is prepared, and I'm open that they'll prove me wrong. But... I'm not holding my breath. There is no basis upon which to trust I next to do the right thing. Well, well how, how you know disappointed do you feel? You know, seeing the way that that turned out um, with the presidential elections, and of course now we're going into the governorship elections. There's still you know seemingly much clamor for free and fair elections. There's a lot of expectations also. But um, you, one thing I've always asked is, you know, when we see you know from what people have said, you know, this level of incompetence that eventually does provide a president-elect, you know, and it seems like Nigerians, you know, are almost not able to express themselves well enough and we just move on. So, you know, it, it, tell me how you feel about, you know, how the, the whole process, you, from what it looks like, will just come and go and we might just move on like that and accept it, you know, the way that it is. Um, and I, and Nigerians also ready for Saturday's elections, the governorship elections, even if you say INEC may not be ready. 
Well, one thing I can tell you, Nigerians have been ready for a while to be rid of this horrible government. At almost every level of our governance system, we've been plagued by all manner of incompetent and wicked people. So Nigerians were ready on the 25th. We took out in record numbers. That is to show you that we were always ready for change. But trooping out in record numbers did not stop INEC from concocting figures and manufacturing numbers that were completely at variance with the reality. But that is to one side. You asked how disappointed I am. I'm sorry to say, and though this might sound a little, perhaps, fatalistic, I am not disappointed. INEC has not disappointed me. Disappointment is the space that exists between your expectation and the reality. I expected INEC to be as useless as it was on the 25th. The only thing that might have happened is I was a little surprised that they surpassed my expectation of the depth to which they were prepared to sink. So it's not about disappointment. I'm not disappointed with INEC. I am also cognizant of the fact that on this Saturday, a lot of people remembering what INEC had done in the last election might find themselves despondent to the point where they might believe that it is more profitable to be disconnected from that system i am of the firm opinion that the only thing we are left with which answers the question as to the preparedness of the people we must be prepared to continue to assert our rights let INEC continue to prove itself to be as incompetent as it is let every other person the so-called politicians their henchmen on our street that we call thugs who are actually part and parcel of the evil governance system that we have, let them come out and do their things. Let the world see. We'll go out with our cameras. We'll go out and make sure we gather evidences of what they are doing. We will deny legitimacy to this evil. You said we'll sure go our shoulders and move on. Look, the cosmic balance has been thrown into tailspin. Somebody grabbed what he was not given by force but a thief might enter my car he might even start the car but as long as i'm the one who has to open the door for that thief to exit with my car it's up to me to decide whether i want to open the door or not the INEC select president might be sworn in by INEC and all the forces of impunity in nigeria but it's not going to change the fact that we did not elect him he has a long road to illegitimacy in front of him. As useless as our courts might be, I'm sure we'll take him through that process to further strip him of any legitimacy he might be seeking to find in his fraud. We did not elect him, and it is not up to INEC to force anybody on us. All right, let's talk about uh, some of the alliances, I would say. I won't call them mergers. We've seen that or there have been reports, and I'd like you to clarify the truth or otherwise of these reports, of the Labour Party throwing its weight behind the PDP uh, gubernatorial candidates in Ogun State, in Nasarawa, in Enugu. And there are further reports that this is causing some form of division in the camp of the obedience. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. You know, when uh, Yorubas have this proverb, they say, Ogolun Temubayetong, when you are rich, everybody knows you. If you are a poor man, you get disowned. The Labour, uh, the Labour Party has been in existence for a while, but the obedient movement is a recent phenomenon. Now, it's a movement that a lot of people find political capital in and they seek to exploit. What I can tell you as a fact is this. In Lagos State, there is nothing like the Labour Party throwing his weight behind the PDP. I know that there is a lot of horse trading going on. Tinubu is busy in his transfer season, buying all kinds of non-entities as politicians who are meant to help them to authorize their ticket this hour day. I know that in Enugu State, the principal, Mr. Peter Albi, has come out categorically to explain the fact that where Labour Party has candidates, we don't go into alliance with anybody. The Labour Party is the vehicle through which the obedient movement is actualizing its intentions. In Enugu State, there is a Labour Party candidate, and Mr. Peter Obi was very categorical in making clear that that is the person behind whom he stands. Mrs. Aisha Yusuf, an illustrious member of the obedient movement, well within her right, decided that she 
would prefer to cite Frank Nweke, a good man. That's a call. I have no horse in the IRAs. I believe one gentleman that has been expelled from the obedient movement, on Yere or something of that nature, came out and presumed to speak on behalf of what he called, in fairness to him, he didn't call it OBI, it was obedient. So it is very possible that he has another organization that is leading that is different from the obedient movement. But as far as the obedient movement is concerned, we told the line taken by the principal, there is a candidate for the Labour Party in Enugu State, and that is the candidate for the movement as far as Mr. Peter Obi is concerned, and that is where I say I don't have any personal house in that race. When it comes to, I think those are the two states you've mentioned, if my memory serves um, me right. So there's Enugu, Nasarawa, and uh, Ogun State. I would not be able to speak categorically in relation to either Ogun or Nasarawa because, as I said, I am not in the inner workings of the Labour Party itself. I don't know what might have been decided. The fact that I can even speak to Enugu is mainly because the principal has spoken to it and I was privy to that discussion. But when it comes to Nasarawa and Enugu and, and um, Ogun State. whatever state that was now, um, Ogun State, I really cannot speak in good conscience. I just know that we are definitely not in any alliance with APC in Ogun State because they are the reasons why we are almost unable to field candidates there because of the shenanigans they entered into with INEC in Ogun State. So whatever the people in Ogun State have done, I really can't speak to that with any certainty. Right. Right, Mr. Valtubel, I also want your thoughts on the way that the campaigns have been run in the last few weeks. Um, I've continued to see that there's been an influx of statements, you know, bigotry and tribalism and who is an original Legotian and who is a fake Legotian and who can speak Yoruba fluently and who cannot speak Yoruba fluently. There's also, of course, now the Oro Festival, I think, is it Oro Oro, um, that has been mentioned in, in all of this, you know, in all of this space. So let, let's quickly get your thoughts on that. Um, it doesn't seem like the normal way a campaign is run um, pre-election. Um, there are several things about Nigeria that are unfortunately peculiar to us and unique to us. Very unfortunate. When you hear a person who decries racism, promoting tribalism, it crosses my mind each time I listen to them or run across their pieces that the tribalist is actually the stupid cousin of the racist. But the craziest part of our situation is that those fanning the embers of ethnicity, particularly in Lagos, they are actually the least tribalistic. They are just using tribe and ethnicity as a tool of political mobilization and to also divide those who had united in the past to hand them the resounding defeats that they received on the 25th. On the 25th of February, I can't speak to other states, I can speak for Lagos. Lagosians trooped out in their numbers across the length and breadth of Lagos, whether those be Igbos, Yoruba, Zausa, Ijoz, Bini, name it. Across the length and breadth of Lagos, from Badagri to Ekwe, we whooped Bola and Met in Ubuzas. But in order to do what they are doing today, between himself, Shekun Agbaje, the INEC wreck in Lagos State, and NEC, I wreck itself, the uh, INEC itself, what they did was that they concocted figures to suggest that the voters turnout was as low as less than 1.5 million. And then they doctored the figures to suggest that the election was close, that it was a 10,000 vote difference. There was nothing of the sort. Bola Abetinobu was resoundingly rejected in Lagos State. The people rejected him. The PDP situation room says, Labour Party had over 900,000 votes. PDP itself had a little over 100,000. And APC came, sec came second with just a little over 100,000 itself. So you, start, you find that the margin was quite wide, but in order to create the narrative that it was the Igbos in Lagos State that voted against Tinubu, so that they can then start all this ethnic bigotry that they are putting all over the place, they doctored the figures to bring it close. Lagos State... Is too cosmopolitan for the nonsense that they are trying. Oro here, Oro there, just to intimidate. But it tells you just exactly how much the state 
I'm talking Nigeria, not just Lagos State. The state itself is failing and is collapsing. When using the auspices of the state, you find criminal elements hiding behind the governance systems, whether that be the traditional institution or even the police, because you find policemen standing aside while citizens, quote and unquote, were being intimidated and told that they cannot vote in a particular way. You find markets being burnt and the guard being killed. You find areas where certain people trade being attacked simply to create the impression that there is some ethnic strife to depress voters' turnout, to intimidate those they consider their opposition. So let's be clear. Okay. This is not about tribalism. It's about politics. Dirty politics. Nothing more. All right. All right. Uh, just before Olive jumps in, you just to quickly apologize. Uh, use of language, um, Mr. Faratimi. Uh, there are certain words I'm not sure, I'm not sure we can say. Such as which one, please? Um, whooped somebody's, you know. Oh, you pardon my apologize. friend. I was just simply going to no. say we beat him black and blue in Lagos State. He got oh. less than 20% of the vote, regardless oh. of the doctrine. We beat him black and yeah, blue. That's, that's pardon what he that friendly. friend. I won't speak that kind of English again, but sorry. <laughs> All right, now let's uh, talk about the judicial process or the judiciary. We recall that in the, in 2006, uh, Mr. Peter Obi was the first to unseat a sitting governor through the help of the judiciary by contesting his case in court. Now, we know that your party is currently challenging the process by which the president-elect was announced. Uh, do you have faith in the judiciary being able to um, turn around this result and, you know, what are the expectations? Are you expecting fresh elections or that we will currently work with the evidence that your party has collated? Remember the PDP um, uh, spokesperson says, you know, that they have faith and that, you know, it's likely that it will be overturned and fresh And elections. they want fresh elections. Yeah. Well, put it this way. Boala is a lawyer. Me, I'm a retired lawyer. So our perspectives on the judiciary might not necessarily be the same. I have zero faith in the capacity of the Nigerian judiciary to do justice. I'm not even just talking about the electoral petition. I'm speaking specifically to the fact that our judiciary is incapable of delivering justice. That's my personal view. However, as you rightly pointed out, Mr. Peter Obi was the first to go all the way in the electoral petition when he was seeking to regain his mandate as governor of Anambra State. He spent three years pursuing Ngige before he got him out of place. Mr. Peter Obi is, is made of different clothes from me. I don't have the patience or the trust to go through the physical gyration of what we call a judiciary. But he believes, and we also believe, if I may add, my lack of confidence in the judiciary is not for want of evidence to prove our point and our case that Mr. Peter will be won the election. That is not the problem. The problem is because of my own understanding of that institution and just exactly how rotten it has become from top all the way to the bottom. is rotten. It is just as useful as our police or our custom. It is not in any way better than any one of those ones. It is a typically Nigerian institution. That is one. So, Mr. Peter Obi believes he will get justice from there. It is up to the Nigerian judiciary to decide exactly how putrefied it is and exactly how ready it is to meet the challenges of the future. That is in his own hand. We will prove our case in court. We would also prove it in the court of public opinion. How useless or useful a judiciary is will be a matter of evidence that the whole country will see. We have laws, but they have rarely ever been observed. It is actually those who are charged with the duty of upholding the laws who always trample on it with impunity. But our system has always operated on the basis of impunity. Rarely ever on the basis of justice. So, maybe... The judiciary will find a way to prove the like of us wrong. Maybe Mr. Peter Obim will yet again prove to be the very first who will get a presidential mandate returned. But in my own view, whatever I decides to do or not do, the one thing it honestly cannot do is swear him his president select. We did not vote that man. 
we did not. And the evidence is clear, we did not. And we will prove it. So when that has been proven, it is now up to INEC to decide, and the court, I should, I should say, it's up to them to decide on the basis of the evidence whether we should be having another election or whether what we had done that was truncated by INEC is still is still prescribable in some way. That would be up to the court to determine. The only thing that must not stand is the fraud that INEC has perpetrated. Dele Faratimi, thank you so much for your time this morning. We always find it interesting. Thank you very much for having Thanks me. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to bringing you in, uh, in again. Thank you.